Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this, mor- this afternoon, and we're so grateful that you are our God. You're s- you are uh, more holy than we could ever possibly imagine. And we know that we won't understand the depth of your righteousness until the day that we stand before you in glorified bodies. Help us to prepare for that day well to not take you lightly, to not take your church lightly, to not take your word lightly, to not take our own souls lightly. Father, we want to enjoy the life that you've given us, and we want to think well about you, and we want to live well for you. We ask that this, this time we have together, at the end of this day together, might be used by you to the praise of your glorious grace, for the good of our own souls, and for the edification of the churches. We are so privileged to be a part of. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." I want to talk this afternoon about holiness and ministry. Uh, I, don't, I don't want what I say to be perceived as a rebuke of you or, or to you. I'm not delivering this message with the assumption that you are, are living in, 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 in gross immorality. I, mean, I, know, I know you're a sinner. You know, I, I'm aware of that. I'm a sinner. I don't, I don't mean this message, the tone of this message, in any way to be rebuked to you. I am aware of the possibility of there being some here who are really burdened by the reality of sin in your life, that you've never experienced the kind of uh, long-term pattern of holiness with regard to this particular struggle, and it's, it's bearing down on you. And so I have, I have a category for someone like that. Someone who really actually is even a Christian, but struggling that way. So wherever, wherever you are, I really want to speak to you for the next little while uh, as, as a sinner to another sinner. Uh, maybe for some of you as, a, as an older brother to a younger brother. And, and, and say some things about holiness and ministry that I trust are not in any way going to, going to be novel. But so much of Christian ministry is, is not delivering, I think none of Christian ministry is delivering what's novel. It's, it's reminding you of what you should already know, that you might run perhaps with greater diligence, uh, the, 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 the run on the path in front of you. And so that's what our time together is going to be about. I want to begin by talking a little bit about Don Carson, who's mentioned at the, at the Q&A, because it was in the mid-1990s that uh, I was, it was a Sunday evening service in Washington, D.C., and I was at my church, and I heard Don Carson talk about, he, he gave us a short message on these qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, and uh, what he said, uh, it's, it, struck, it struck me at the time. I trust it wasn't the first time he said it. He might not even be the first person to have said it. I, I'm sure he wasn't. It's the first time I heard it, and since I heard it, I have to say I've heard it a lot over the years, and he said, what's remarkable about the qualifications for an elder in 1 Timothy 3 is how unremarkable they are. And that really hit me. Uh, I never really thought about that before. He pointed out how the only qualifications unique to that of an, of an elder are that he not be a recent convert and that he be able to teach. But other than that, they're very, they're very unremarkable. Now, as I've thought about that statement over the years, and, and obviously that was a long time ago that I first heard him say that, I realized that I have been tempted, and this is not Dr. Carson's fault, this is my fault, but I've been tempted to, to have that sentence in my mind 
and to somehow minimize the elder qualifications in my mind. They're unremarkable after all. Right? Uh, an, an elder just needs to be as holy a, as an ordinary Christian. Now, of course, that was not Carson's intention, but I do think it's possible to be underwhelmed by the qualifications of an elder and therefore neglect tending to your soul in, in a way that is the Holy Spirit's intention in inspiring these very verses. So maybe this is my way of saying, at least in my own life, I need to fight against Satan and my flesh who wants me to be underwhelmed with these qualifications. And that's what, so this talk is, is intended to help us not be underwhelmed, but to be appropriately overwhelmed by the qualifications of, of elder ministry. And this is so important because as, as I look out over the evangelical landscape uh, in, 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 my, in my lifetime even, I, I have seen the elevation of skills over sanctification. The elevation of, of competency over character. And that was uh, certainly the resounding theme of that podcast serial, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, an autopsy of, uh, of Mars Hill, really. Mark Driscoll being a very public example. But how many stories have we never heard? Right? How many men do continue in pastoral ministry covering up serious deficiencies in their personal character? And I'm convinced that the doctrine of personal holiness, if you will, is one of the least difficult to understand. I mean, no one needs a, a PhD in this. And yet, I remain convinced it's the easiest to ignore. And I don't think you pay attention to it by listening to messages on it, even. That's how insidious sin is. It doesn't matter how many messages on holiness you hear. That's, that's not where the battle is won. No one wakes up and says, I think I'll fall out of ministry today. I went on a mission trip so many years ago, and... Uh, we were going to stop in Moscow and then make our way to the Ukraine. And literally, we're in Moscow visiting some other mission friends there. And uh, one of my teammates gets a call because the missionary slash pastor in the Ukraine that very week had fallen out of pastoral ministry. And his ministry came to an end that day. Uh, I pastor in, in Atlanta and Ravi Zacharias, the, the, what were the headquarters of RZIM, just about 20 minutes north from me in Alpharetta, Alpharetta, Georgia. Ravi Zacharias, uh, before I was ever at Mount Vernon, he would attend every once in a while uh, the church that I'm at now. And, you know, that a tarnished reputation of an evangelical leader does damage. I know that God's not going to lose any of his elect. I mean, I'm so glad to be a Calvinist. <laughs> but I don't want to rest in an ungodly way in that, in that theological reality. I do believe that the tarnished reputation of an evangelical leader really does. It, does. it does damage. Now, sexual purity in the life of Christians and, and of pastors is, of course, hugely important. You know, uh, the, 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 the pastor must be a, a, a one-woman man. But one of my concerns is that we can focus on sexual purity to the neglect of all other kinds of purity. Holiness in ministry is so much more than being a one-woman man. It's possible that you're sexually pure, but you're a glutton. It's possible that you're sexually pure, but you're inhospitable. It's possible that you're sexually pure, but you really are greedy. There's more than one way to be disqualified from ministry. And there's, there's more, and even more important than that, there are worse things in the world than being disqualified from ministry. There are other ways to pay the bills. But there, there's more than one way to make a shipwreck of your faith. And so in that sense, we need to be holistic about our approach to holiness. God drove this point home to me a, a number of years ago because as a, as a young man, I would, as I was pray, I would pray. You know, I had time with the Lord and I'd pray uh, against lust and I'd pray against laziness, and I'd pray against pride. And I basically thought I had the market cornered on the types of sins that would knock me out of ministry. You know, lust, laziness, and pride. And uh, a few years into ministry, 
a young man who was a pastoral assistant at our church. He was on the cusp of being recognized by the congregation, really being, of being recommended to the congregation as an elder. And he also was on, he was on staff, and he filled out a performance evaluation. In, the, in that performance evaluation, the question was asked uh, by me of him, is there anything I need to know to better serve you as your supervisor? And in his answer, he said, I'm not sure that I can serve as an elder with you because I have found repeatedly that in personal conversation with you, you are harsh and intimidating. And I, I'm, 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 I'm reading that, and my first response is, you, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I know harsh and intimidating men. I'm not one of them. And it was very tempting for me to think, you really got to get a thick skin. But by God's grace, you know, I'm a Christian, <laughs> and, and I knew him to be a Christian, younger than me, yes, but a, but a Christian, and so I encouraged him to find a couple other elders, to just select, we had, maybe we had 10 elders at the time, I said, would you choose a couple elders that you especially trust, and let's all get together, and in their presence, let me, let them hear your concerns about me, and over the course of a few meetings, I better understood that, that I can be harsh. And the reason why I say that is that I had no idea. I mean, if you had, I mean, literally, if you had say, go on a retreat and spend 48 hours, you know, examining your heart, I guarantee, I just would not have thought I was harsh. Because I wasn't really comparing, comparing myself to Jesus, and I hadn't read Gentle and Lowly. Um, uh, I was comparing, comparing myself to, to, to other, other men. And so that was a, God used that mightily in my life to help me better understand my sin and God's, God's holiness. So it's not interesting to me that I struggled. That is not interesting to me, and it shouldn't be interesting to you. What's interesting is that I didn't know it. I was a bad example without knowing I was a bad example. And if we just have that category in our mind, I feel like I can, we can end right now. If you just have that category, that it's possible that you are a bad example without knowing it, then I think, I, I feel like this talk would have been a success. But in order to fill the time, let me keep going. <laughs> Pastors must constantly assess their character because Scripture demands pastors live exemplary lives. Pastors must constantly assess their character because Scripture demands pastors live exemplary lives. Now, with that in mind, I want to ask three questions. I may only get to two of them. So if I just don't get to the third question, you can ask Alex for your money back. Right? First, what does it mean to be exemplary in personal holiness? Second, why is this so important? And third, what should you do if you're falling short? All right, first, what does it mean to be exemplary in personal holiness? It means that every aspect of your life is worthy of imitation. Look again at 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This list of qualifications has been categorized in a number of ways. I think it's helpful to put them in two buckets. For my purposes, it's helpful to put them in two buckets. The first bucket is to say that, that a few of these qualifications are specific. They're specific. I think there's seven. An elder is uh, the, to be the husband of one wife, a one-woman man, this is the qualification related specifically to sexual morality, to faithfulness. If married, he's devoted to his wife. If unmarried, he is, he, he is uh, saving himself for a, a, a woman, should he one day be married. Sober-minded. That's specific. He's a serious man. Right? He, he knows how and when to put the joking aside to discuss matters of, of life and death. He's able to teach, verse 2 is specific. He must be able to rightly divide the word of truth, to explain the Bible accurately, to apply it wisely. 
He is not a drunkard. He's not a drunkard. That is quite specific. He's not a lover of money. That is targeting the sin of greed. There are temptations in ministry to use God's money given by God's people in frivolous and selfish ways. Uh, for dads, keeping his children submissive is specific. Like one can peer into a family and see if the children are sensitive to their father's authority. Of course, not uh, being a recent convert is specific. Uh, though no amount of time is given, you either are or are not a recent convert. Now, the specificity of these requirements tells us that Paul had a particular interest in ensuring pastors are marked by sexual purity, mental sobriety, doctrinal fidelity, sobriety, financial propriety, godly authority, and spiritual maturity. Now, there are, however, a host of qualifications that I would put into a second bucket, the bucket of general. These are general qualifications. Again, I see seven. I'm not implying that God inspired seven and seven. I'm just doing my best to, to, to try to figure out what is, what is Paul intending to do with this list. So an elder is to be above reproach, a catch-all term for integrity. No accusation made against an elder should stick because he's a transparently godly man. He is self-controlled. Self-controlled in what? Everything. He is to be respectable. Again, one might ask, well, in what arena of his life is he to be respectable? Every arena. Hospitable. Now, you might argue hospitality is a very specific qualification. Maybe it's in the middle, right? Hospitality, I think, applies to so many areas of a man's life. His posture toward his neighbors, his, his love for the lost, his discipleship in the church. I mean, he's the type of man who, and I want to be careful not to be too specific, because that's the whole point of it. It's, it's general, but his home is open. His heart is open. He's hospitable. So that's why I take it to be a, a broad term. No, he is, and I'm combining a few here. He's not violent, but gentle. He's not quarrelsome. Not quarrelsome. Right? This is Paul describing a man who gets on well with others in, in all avenues of life. He doesn't scream at the person on the other end of the phone. You know, he keeps his cool at the elders' meeting. He's not upset to lose a vote. He doesn't fly off the handle when someone criticizes him, even unfairly. I take manage his own household well to be general as well. It could relate to how much time he spends at work, uh, how, much time he, he, how much initiative he takes in family devotions, how he takes care of the yard, and on and on and on, this big category of his home. Well thought of by outsiders is another. Closely related, I think, to being, being above reproach. He's got a good reputation, and, and, and his neighbor's uh, he, he is a good neighbor in a thousand and one ways. Now, you can quibble rightly with how I've categorized these qualifications, but I think you'll agree with me that there are some specific temptations to be aware of. The big picture is that every facet of an elder's life is under scrutiny. He's an example in, in every possible way. So we can debate who is the GOAT, the greatest of all time of the NBA, LeBron or Michael. Well, it's, it's Michael, but, <laughs> and I can say that because, well, I don't know him personally, but I, I detest the Chicago Bulls, but it is what it is, you know. Think of an, el so, okay, so here's the deal. Michael is the GOAT, but LeBron plays every position. Who does that? Think of an elder as a Christian who plays every position in the game of holiness. Yes, the qualifications of an elder are remarkable for being unremarkable. Our lives are to be exemplary in, in, in every way. And though every pastor is first and foremost simply a Christian, there is no doubt the pastor is a leading Christian. And he, he is to lead out in holiness, modeling for the church what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. 
In that sense, the pastor must be more vigilant against sin, more aware of his temptation, more committed to personal holiness. Paul's writings back up the proposition that a pastor is to be exemplary in holiness. I've been in 1 Timothy 3, but if you look at, at the corpus of Paul's writings, I think it, it backs this up. Paul commanded the Ephesian elders, and by extension all elders, to pay careful attention to their lives, Acts 20, 28. Paul described the minister's life as holy, righteous, and blameless, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Every, every member of the church should be blameless. The pastor must be blameless. Otherwise, he's not qualified to be a pastor. He urged Timothy to have a good conscience, 1 Timothy 1, 5 and 19. He warned that young pastor against participating in the sins of others, 1 Timothy 5, 22. Paul summed up his counsel by asserting the pastor is to flee sin and pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. It's a very general application. Pursue righteousness. Well, where? <laughs> Everywhere. 1 Timothy 6.11. To be exemplary is to live a life that's, that's a faithful pattern for how a Christian ought to behave. Christians, Christians can, but they don't learn how to be holy simply by reading the Bible. They can, but they don't. They're to look at the example set by their pastors. I was so taken aback by that comment that a young person can know. What did you say that you knew that you could go to Jesus because you could go to your pastor? That's what I'm talking about. I'm just double-clicking on that line and giving you another hour. It's why Paul told the Corinthians, the Philippians, the Thessalonians to imitate him. It's why he told Timothy to set an example for the Ephesians in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. It's why he told Titus to be a model of good works. And going back to 1 Timothy 3, I think it's why Paul began with above reproach. The New Testament expectation is that the elders will be so well known for their holiness that it would be ridiculous to accept an allegation against them unless there are multiple accusers. 1 Timothy 4.12 So the pastor's life should be a faithful pattern for how a Christian ought to behave. Believers must be able to look at our lives and learn how to relate to members of the opposite sex. And since the office of pastors for men, relate to women. <laughs> Handle their money. Use alcohol. Be a churchman. Work hard. Rest well. Evangelize. Disciple. And the list goes on and on. Now, the point is not that everyone should be like you. I mean, please spare us from that. I mean, I think I'm great, you know, but man, Mount Vernon would be a mess if there were two of me. The point is not that everyone should be like you, but the point is that your life should be a reliable guide for faithful Christian living. You are to be exemplary in personal holiness. Now the question is, allow me to ask the question, why? Why is the pastor's exemplary personal holiness so very important? And, and you and you just sitting there, you could come up with, with your own answers, even biblical answers. Let me share a few that I have first. Because his very salvation is at stake. His very salvation is at stake. As Peter said to the believers in 2 Peter 1.10, Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, these qualities, you will never fall. You know, Peter was referring to qualities listed in verses 5 through 7. Uh, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, 
steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Right? The man and the woman, truly born again, the man saved, will practice these qualities. They will mark him. And the man who will not will fail and make a shipwreck of his faith. Now, that's true of every Christian. But there is a greater scrutiny applied to the life of a pastor. And this is James's point in James 3.1 when he actually discourages brothers from taking the mantle of pastor. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, this is a hard passage. One way to think of it is to picture two craftsmen. One is told to build a trough for the barn, and another craftsman is told to build a, a chest to hold the king's crown. Whose work will be judged with greater scrutiny? The man building the, the, the chest? The man building the trough? Well, the man building the, the chest for the crown. The pastor is to be like that. A worker building a treasure chest for a king. We're to be hard at work building that which is most important to God, his church. And our tool is not a hammer, uh, but the very word of God. And our medium is not wood, but the very souls of men. Not many of you should be teachers. James wants the Christian to be slow to take up the mantle of pastoral leadership. He's to count the cost because his life will now be devoted to that which is most precious in God's eyes. And I I am casting no aspersions at building technology companies, at building heating and air conditioning companies. I am so thankful for both. But I'm simply standing in the Bible and saying there is one family against whom the gates of hell will not prevail, and that's the church. And that's what the pastor's life is devoted to building. In a way that I'm not fully able to explain, God will judge the pastor with more scrutiny than he does any other professional on the face of the planet. You should not enter into, you should not remain in pastoral ministry without a great deal of prayer and self-examination. I know this can go in unhealthy ways. You know, read Jonathan Edwards' introduction to the diary of David Brainerd, and, 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 and you'll, you'll understand that there are, there are men who do this poorly. They can't stop thinking about themselves and all the ways they fall short. I don't want to lead you that direction. I just don't feel that's the, the main problem in evangelicalism today. Constantly ask yourself if you're up to the task mentally, if you're up to the task emotionally, if you're up to the task spiritually, if you're up to the task morally. I take 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15, as a parallel to James 3, 1. Listen to what Paul wrote there. I believe that Paul is writing about those in pastoral ministry when he says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Right, getting back to what Phil was teaching us this morning. Jesus is the foundation. He is the ministry. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day, the day of judgment, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Paul is connecting the ministry of the teacher and salvation. He's concerned about the content of our message and the character of our lives. Both are important. Neglect one, and you risk finding out on the day of judgment either that we did not know the Lord at all or of being saved, but only as through fire. Pastor, are you a Christian? Can you pinpoint evidence in your life of the Spirit's work? Would people around you testify that grace and mercy pour forth from your life like fresh water pouring forth from a mountain spring? None of us is perfect. Can you underline that or all caps? None of us is perfect. We all fall short. 
but we ought to attend to our own personal holiness for the sake of our salvation. Now, why is a pastor's example so important? Here's another reason. Because the salvation of others is at stake. 1 Timothy 4.16 should be etched on the wall of our hearts. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. If I could, if I could make this happen, uh, on Monday morning, uh, on, the, uh, on the wall in my bedroom... I would just look up and see the word persist. Another Sunday is closed. Monday's begun. Persist. Persist in this. We are right to attribute salvation to Christ alone, but if we neglect to factor in the role of the pastor, we have diminished the office we are privileged to hold. Somehow, in God's economy, he uses not just our words, but our very lives to press upon the hearts of our hearers the reality of God's saving grace. And in so doing, though both our word, through both our words and our witness, God saves some. So when I, when I hear about Spurgeon... I just, I can't help but think this is a godly man. If this is real, if this is real, it's not because he's super smart. It's not because he had a great vocabulary. This is not in any way disagreeing with anything you said, but it must be this is a man who did business with the Lord. If, if I'm reading the Bible rightly, commenting on this verse John Calvin addressed this unusual reality. He said, a pastor will become even more zealous when he is told that both his salvation and that of the people who listen to him depend on his devotion to his office. This is John Calvin. God alone saves, and no part of his glory can be transferred to men, but God's glory is not at all diminished when he employs men's efforts to bestow salvation. God alone is the author of salvation, but this does not exclude the ministry of men for the well-being of the church depends on that ministry. So, a surgeon may have the finest schooling and the perfect skill, but if he comes to that operating room drunk, enough said. A pastor may be seminary educated and doctrinally sound, but if he pursues his vocation with moral laxity, God may very well pass over his ministry field and turn his attention to the field of another. I am aware of how you could take what I just said wrongly. I know, I know, because I know me. <laughs> think, oh, I see. The reason my church isn't growing is because I'm not godly enough. I understand the danger of a sinful heart hearing what I just said and drawing wrong conclusions. And I just, if, if your mind is going there, think about it, pray about it, talk about it. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. Watch your life and your doctrine that you might save yourself and others. Now, we've got at least two examples of this kind of ministry in the life of the Apostle Paul. The Bible doesn't leave us with no examples of what this looks like. Consider first Acts 20, uh, verses 17 through 38. Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders on the end of his third missionary journey while he's traveling south to Jerusalem. He recounts how he taught them carefully. He mentions how he taught them publicly, how he went, verse 20, house to house. So Paul taught them carefully. Paul taught them personally. 
And his personal ministry had a profound effect on them. Now, how do I know that? How do we know that? Acts chapter 20, verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him. Being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Now nothing in this passage tells me that Paul lived a holy life while he was among them. But he he clearly shared life with them. Obviously they cared about his doctrine. Without the gospel they'd be condemned to hell. But my point is Paul did more than share the gospel. He had a personal ministry among them. That brings me to another example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Speaking to this church, Paul says, We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share not only the gospel, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Again, I'm wrestling here with, with Paul's words to Timothy about watching yourself and your teaching that you might save yourself and your hearers. Somehow, in God's economy, he uses our words and our witness to save some. And so it should be no surprise that as we look at Paul's ministry, that he did diligently shared not only the, the, the gospel, not only sound doctrine, but he affectionately shared his own life as well. To quote Alex DePrima, I I knew that I could go to Jesus because I could go to my pastor. I don't want to drive you to legalism. Uh, If anyone's wondering, no, I don't have an independent fundamentalist Baptist background. Not aiming to drive any of you to legalism. And I don't want any of you to think that the success of your ministry is in any way fundamentally dependent upon your life. Like I, I, I respect the fact that Paul commended the preaching of the gospel even when the preacher was plagued with bad motives. Philippians 1, I'm really thankful for Philippians 1.18. The word of God objectively has power. I don't want in any way to devalue the objective power of the preached word of God. I simply want to ask the question, is it possible that God keeps revival at bay because the lives of his elders are not exemplary. Brothers, heed Paul's charge. Keep a close watch on yourself. Don't let a day go by without pleading with God to fill you to overflowing with all the pieces of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because that holiness is required not only for your sake, but for the good and the growth of the church that God has given you to lead. And if you're here this afternoon and you're not a, you're not a, a, a pastor, maybe you're, you're an aspiring pastor, I don't want anything I've said to, well, I do want what I've said to discourage you from going into ministry, I guess. I mean, if you're taking it lightly, and if, you're, if, if all you can think about when you think about being a pastor is being able to answer questions or being able to preach sermons or you know, being able to draw a crowd, you're just thinking about it the, the wrong way. You've got to play every, every position. Lots of great preachers don't know the Lord. If you're here and you are like, maybe you're, um, you're, you're a deacon, you're a, a faithful servant, and you're at Feed My Sheep because, I don't know, you love your pastor, you love your church, you need to pray for your elders. I, 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 I don't, think there are differing degrees of rewards in heaven. If there are, what I'm saying fits in really well with that. (laughs) Either way, I know this. Judgment day is going to be awkward and uncomfortable for those ministers building with hay. Pray for them. Receive them as God's gift to your church. Make their ministry a, a joy, not a burden. Recognize Satan wants them to be unexemplary in every possible way that revival might be kept at bay and that they might go to hell. Pray for them. 
Maybe you're here this afternoon at this Feed My Sheep conference not being a pastor, not ever going to be a pastor, because God's going to bless your prayers more than the preaching of the word in the life of your local church. Uh, why is a pastor's holiness so important for his own salvation and for the salvation of his hearers? There's more questions we could ask today. I think I'm going to stop and pray and leave it at that. Would you join me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful privilege of pastoral ministry, for the joy there is in shepherding the flock of God, in preaching the word of God, in evangelizing the lost, in discipling the saved. Pastoral ministry is such a great joy. Father, we pray for every elder in this room that he would be a man marked by exemplary holiness. We pray for the churches entrusted to the care of these elders, that men and women and saved children would be growing in grace and godliness because of your preached word and because of the example of your preachers. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness in giving us this day to reflect upon ministry in the shadow of the cross. May we heed Phil's counsel and be men who desire to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. May we attend to the words that we speak, that we might not take teaching lightly. May we learn from exemplary models of preaching like your faithful servant, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And Heavenly Father, might we grow in holiness, recognizing with our brother John Newton that we're not the men we should be. We're not the men we one day will be, but we praise you that we're not the men we once were. And may our congregation learn not merely from, not merely from demonstration of doing the thing right, but of repentance when we do the wrong thing. Help us in all these ways. To your name be the glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.